Okay, so the questions today. Um, I think I will uh, just uh, start a little bit uh, um, uh, top down. Um, and the first question I would like to answer is the question is how do you define um, the type or the nature of your soul or spirit? What kinds of souls and spirit types exist and do they have different frequencies? Um, what determines the nature of the soul? How can one's soul nature be read by others? Is there a relation between the soul nature and the various cosmoses? Is there a relation between the soul nature and the egregores? So, well, that's actually one question, but it's composed of a lot of sub-questions. Okay, I'll try to move the microphone a bit. Okay, is this um, better now? Okay, I will just move it away from my mouth. Hello, hello. Okay, I'm glad that's better. Okay, so um, let's start with the definition of. Uh, so let's start with the definition of um, what is a soul or a, a spirit, and it depends very much on the yeah on the system you're working with. Uh, so some religious systems define the the spirit as being eternal and the soul as being temporal or the other way around. Um, the way I usually use it is that the soul is the eternal part of our being and the spirit is the temporary part of our being. Um, so our soul is relatively um, shapeless, formless, identityless. Um, it's really the core and the spirit is more of a, a manifestation of that core. And in a way the, uh, the souls can also have different natures. Um, and um, uh, in a way the condition of the soul is very much dependent uh, on the type of cosmos it belongs to. So, um, depending on our uh, higher sins, which I talked about in an earlier lesson, if we have no higher sins, if we are, our soul is at one with the will of the, uh, the Absolute, with the will of the Creator, then we belong to the Divine Cosmos. Um, if our uh, strongest sin is that of goodness, the desire to relate and to connect to other beings, then we belong to the satanic cosmos and if our strongest relationship is to ourselves um, to, with an interest in our own development, our own improvement then we tend to belong to the uh, luciferical cosmos and if we um, like to, um, to use our power, our influence on others or over others then we tend to belong to the Ariman cosmos but even though we can belong to these different cosmoses, even within a cosmos, there is a, a yeah, big difference between the types of souls. Um, there are souls which are, um, in a way, created directly by the Absolute. Um, so this is kind of like the first generation of, uh, of souls. And um, then the things start to get a little bit more complicated. Um, because these first generation of souls, the archangels, if you will, 
um, they also started to create because they were in a way created in the image of the creator and they themselves inherited the desire also to create and there can be various processes in this so if you have such a high spirit it can um, in a way uh, take a part of itself or copy part of itself not its whole and make that into an autonomous being uh, so just like the archangels are not quite as great as the absolute as the creator the creation is slightly smaller slightly less and in this way you can in a way a, a soul can clone itself it can create lots of clones so the nature of our being can be the clone of a higher being and uh, in its nature it will be very similar to the being which uh, which is, is uh, a reflection of or an element of. Um, but because of this uh, process of duplication, of copying, where every copy something loses, uh, then ultimately the beings which are created by the lowest beings, they are very primitive indeed and have a very low consciousness. So to compensate for that, um, actually energies can be mixed in. So uh, one of the options is to mix in energies of the absolute itself. So to co-create, you create something, you know it is imperfect, it's just less than you, but you ask the creator to be part of your creation, part of your process, and some of the energy of the, of the absolute will go into the newly formed soul. Um, in general, this, uh, this newly formed being will be a lot closer to the level of the original creator and will sometimes also possess certain powers the creator does not have because of the influence of the absolute. Instead of the influence of the absolute you can also use the powers of another soul. Um, so two souls together or actually a group of souls together can also create a being and this uh, conglomerated being can be actually greater than any of them. So if you get together with 10 people, each gives in a way part of themselves, then all the parts added together can be greater than any one with member of the group. Um, and in this way, our souls can also have a very different nature. They can be in a way, you could say a fragment or a reflection uh, of a, a a relatively high being of a relatively low being or a conglomerate of uh, conglomerate creationship of many uh, many souls working together and this can also be done both with and without the assistance of the absolute um, the type of soul in a way um, tells you a little bit about uh, fundamental reason for incarnating. So as I said before in the satanic cosmos it is the desire to, to help others and whatever incarnation you will take, whatever spirit is resulting from that uh, soul will have this inherent desire to connect with to other beings and to relate to other beings. But in the same way if we have uh, as our inherent nature of the soul to, um, to work on ourselves, to, to, um, to create effects, to experiment with ourselves. The being which is ultimately created will have that desire to experiment, to learn, to grow, to develop itself. And also if we have the desire to live in an orderly system, to create rules or to follow rules, then this will be also inherent in uh, yeah, the spirit we create. And the spirit we create uh, depends very much upon the available energies. So um, the soul ultimately starts connecting with other shapeless powers and will slowly move into a collective consciousness. And not in every solar system the same collective consciousnesses are available. And also not the same types of lessons are available. Um, you could have, um, in a way, uh, solar systems without war or with it, without love or without the duality between masculine and feminine. Um, 
So the nature is very much dependent upon the energies of, are, which are available to uh, manifest the tendencies. Um, this also makes it very um, difficult, if you will, from, to move from one solar system to another. Um, and in, in general, this is done, it can only be done by, in a way, dissolving all the experiences or transcending all the experiences you had in one solar system. So your energy can go back and reintegrate in the soul before it reincarnates in another solar system. Um, it is also possible for a soul to have multiple spirits at the same time. So it is possible to, in a way, live in two solar systems at the same time, but each spirit is separated from the other spirit. And only when every spirit which is manifested learns to reconnect to the soul, then they can indirectly also start having contact with each other. Um, working with, with egregores is a really helpful way to move also from solar system to solar system, because um, some of the larger egregores they're active in many different solar systems. So this is a very um, nice way of, in a way, uploading your consciousness or your awareness to that egregore and without having to learn everything there is to learn within that solar system, uh, you can already move to another solar system if the egregore is okay with that. Um, so an egregore, uh, while it in a way asks of you to serve its purpose, it also grants you much more possibilities and much more uh, adventures in uh, in your incarnations. Um, I seem to have lost. Person. Um, Just a moment, I'm trying to get this back. Okay, she seems to be back. Okay. Um. Okay, I hope this works and that you can hear me, Lizzie. some mumbling. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I hear some mumbling but nothing clear. Um Skype seems to have updated with no new thing, so I'm not completely clear on seeing the call back again. Hmm. Okay, um, well I will just continue now and hope everybody can hear me. Um, so. Um, in a way, the, the souls are, um, in my experience, uh, not inherently different from each other because they all come from um, the same source. So uh, most souls were part in the first generation of the unfallen cosmos. Um, but what is a very big distinction is basically that the process of creation did not end with the fall. 
Um, so while some of our souls were created within the unfallen cosmos and therefore have experience with the, the nature of the Absolute um, before they fell down, some of the uh, souls which exist have been created within the fallen cosmos. And so they're lacking the inherent experience um, of the, the, yeah, the, the, heavenly, uh, the heavenly worlds and the universe outside of our universe. And this is also a very, very fundamental difference. Um, because many of the souls who fell have the desire to return. But the souls which were created in the fallen cosmos, they have no idea of uh, yeah, the unfallen cosmos and they also do not have this inherent relationship uh, with the Absolute or experience with the Absolute or desire to get back in touch with the Absolute. Um, so these are souls which are basically born or created in, in darkness or in ignorance. Um, and this is a very fundamental uh, difference in, uh, in their nature of being. Um, these, um, yeah, in a way, darkened souls um, exist in all uh, in all the three different cosmoses, and they can also be both uh, light and dark. So that a being has no knowledge of the of the higher worlds does not say anything about its intention or desire, uh, but any cooperation it would have with uh, the light side, who is very interested in reintegration, would be very blind. Um, so, when a soul has um, has a desire to to move onward. it will generally try to find uh, manifestation forms which are suitable to it. And here it becomes very complex because there are a lot of differences in the population of different solar systems. Um, so if you look at uh, levels of awareness with the bottom level just being material awareness and life force then um, in a way, sensation, emotions, collective consciousness, um, the consciousness of, of powers, of formless powers, and the consciousness of the of the soul of itself. Um, then you see that um, while ideally this should be a pyramid um, or a ladder, uh, this is not true for all solar systems. Some solar systems are populated with only en enlightened beings souls which have um, or spirits which have a consciousness of their soul and some solar systems are populated more like our solar system with beings who only have a consciousness yeah, of their material form and of their own sensations um, so there's a big mix if you will in uh, in every solar system into what type of consciousness is uh, is present um, the type of uh, consciousness is very much dependent upon um, the ability to integrate all the different energies which are available. So every uh, energy requires has a learning curve. How to work with, for instance, solar energy, moon, lunar energy, Jupiter energy, um, all the energies of the different stars, of the different elements. And um, what you do see is that as uh, spirits incarnate more often, or if a soul has had more incarnations within a solar system, they will develop a greater skill in working with the local energies. So a certain um, ability um, to use the energies to, in a way, correctly reflect the nature of the, of the soul is something which, in a way, uh, matures through incarnation, through experience in the solar system. Um, so, the, the, in a way, the maturity of a spirit can be uh, measured by looking how much the incarnated self uh, is very similar to the, the source, to the soul. And if this is more or less a one-on-one -on -one relationship, or uh, if 
it is not completely dissimilar. It is at least a very direct manifestation of the will and the desires of the soul. Then you are talking about an enlightened state of being or an enlightened being. Uh, but for most of us, the lower energies of our bodies, of our thoughts, of our emotions are very different, difficult to control and often also, as I said before, a mix of like our own biological bloodlines, ancestors, karma and lots of other influences which we are unable to yeah, instantly transform or to free ourselves from. Um, so it is a little bit difficult to, to tell um, the nature of a soul from the, uh, the spirit which is manifested in our uh, universe, but a few things can be more or less inferred from it. Um, if you really want to work on a soul level, um, you would have to move up in your, with your own consciousness towards the layer of, uh, of enlightenment to really um, look upon them from one soul to another. Um, so it's difficult to say something about that. Um, what is rather um, confusing to many people is that the, the state of the soul or the spirit does not in a way correspond to what we think of as a natural hierarchy in our physical world. Uh, so an enlightened being may also incarnate as a cat or a dog or a tree and definitely not necessarily as a human being. And this is basically because the, um, the collective consciousness also has a certain quality. And, um, as I said before, you have a different order um, within the dark cosmos and within the light cosmos. So if you look within the, within the dark cosmos, then it is very much an order of power. Um, so the greatest beings here are um, uh, the greater uh, yeah, um, dark angels, dark egregores, uh, uh, landscape spirits who control big regions, and within uh, those regions, there are smaller regions and um, the, the most powerful being within the region on a physical level is usually a human being and below that there are uh, other beings. And um, there's a very nice uh, system which is also used by the Catholic Church of the nine layers of, uh, of well, what they call angels, but they're in a way dark angels, how they um, in a way form a hierarchy which dominates uh, our world. Um, if you look at the light cosmos, it is rather different. Um, because in the light cosmos, it is uh, very much about purity and harmony, which is important, not so much power. Um, so although humans are uh, the strongest manifested being uh, in the dark cosmos, if you look in the light cosmos, it is actually the, the natural beings which are higher than the humans because they are more pure, uh, they are less um, uh, polluted, less uh, in, in fighting or in disagreement with themselves. Um, so it's, it's a very different uh, order uh, which we find there. And if we look at the light cosmos, um, we find that, that actually on the, on the highest level, um, we find the, uh, the spirits who act as the, the guides on our spiritual path. Um, so they are the, the caretakers of, our, uh, of the journey of all living things uh, through their manifested uh, lives, through their incarnations. And um, on a smaller level you have the, the kind of specialized uh, spirits who help people with specific problems in dealing with relationships or a disease or um, financial trouble or uh, learning a, a specific skill. Um, so uh, below that uh, you, you find the trees and um, below the trees you uh, tend to find the greater landscape spirits and below the landscape spirits you find the animal spirits and then you find the human spirits 
and uh, below the human spirits there is actually still the elemental powers. Um, and it's a rather strange order because you would think an element is, is rather pure, rather yeah, simple, always in harmony with itself, but I don't make the system, I don't comprehend it completely either. Um, but in a way the natural order is uh, therefore for, in a way for the elemental powers to react to the desires of the, of the animals. So in a way the landscape will change itself, will reform itself uh, energetically to uh, yeah, in a way respond to what is living on it. Um, and the animals uh, will yeah, respond to, to um, the, yeah, the, the landscape spirits and the landscape spirits are in a way inspired again how to behave, how to shape the landscape by the vegetation which is on it. So it's a rather uh, different system of organizing the world or organizing the landscape than what we are used to. Um, so the different frequencies are indeed very, very apparent. So the highest frequencies, as I said, are um, yeah, the, the guides who guide us on our spiritual path, then the guides who guide for very specific things, then uh, uh, plant spirits, landscape spirits, animal spirits, human spirits, and uh, elemental spirits. And so the elemental spirit tends to have the lowest vibration than the human, than the animal, then. Okay. So how can yeah, one's soul nature be read by others? Um, well, one of the things you can do is in a way, um, yeah, just give people a questionnaire and see how they look upon things, what is their deepest motivation. So you can see a little bit of what, uh, what cosmos they, uh, they belong to. Um, it's also possible for a person who has a different soul nature, so who has an elemental soul nature or animalistic or uh, uh, even nature spirit or tree spirit. Uh, or guiding spirit, soul nature to incarnate or yeah, spirit type to incarnate in any other form. So um, in a way uh, a nature spirit can also incarnate in, in, a, in a human body or even in a, in a stone or in a tree. So they can go higher or lower in, uh, in form. And um, what you often find is that it is uh, a matter of sacrifice. So occasionally you will find that um, a person has a very high consciousness or a tree or a cat and this usually means that a spirit from a higher order has descended to a lower level in a way to help with the collective consciousness of that species. Because it is the collective consciousness which in a way um, creates a very more or less the boundaries of, of what is the average level. So it is very possible for a human to become more um, high than animal spirits or nature spirits or tree spirits or even guiding spirits. Um, what I said are just more general brackets, general systems of uh, looking at, uh, at energetic levels. Um, and uh, such a, uh, in a way, such a lower incarnation is often um, because of a desire to help that specific um, kind of being along. So you can have, um, in a way, humans who have reached enlightenment still incarnating as deer to, in a way, improve the yeah, collective consciousness of the deer uh, as, a, as a whole. So it is not easy to tell from the form. Um, so is there a relation between soul nature and egregores? Yes, there is quite a strong relation between that. Um, because the egregores are um, just like the gods and goddesses, they're often linked to a specific cosmos. So certain egregores are um, uh, yeah, satanic in nature, um, or they are um, 
more interested in the in the unfallen cosmos or in the Lucifer or in the other Romantic cosmos. Um, so egregores are not by definition very limited to, to one cosmos. Um, but just like uh, yeah, gods and goddesses, they tend, because of their nature, the focus, the thing they want to work on, uh, to be very strongly associated with one cosmos. So, um, for instance, the, um, the, the egregore of the, of the Templars, um, which is an egregore of, in a way, the, yeah, creating holy spaces and trying to yeah, climb out of our universe. So it has a um, luciferical aspect because it is about self-improvement, self, -improvement, self um, uh, yeah, growing yourself. And that also has a relationship to the unfallen cosmos, because that is where it, it is trying to lead. Um, so, but therefore it's also like, slightly less strongly connected with the Arimani cosmos and the uh, uh, nature cosmos. And for instance, if you look at um, for instance, the, the egregores of Nora Igma or the Grail Knight, they are very strongly connected to the satanic cosmos. So this is very much uh, growing together, uh, communal travel to a, to a higher cosmos by forming a grail or helping all parts of the group or of the collective consciousness. Um, so yes, egregores are very specific to, uh, to cosmoses. And uh, depending on yeah, the own nature of your soul, you will find also that certain egregores connect to you more easily. So that brings me to uh, the next question about uh, family combinations between uh, dark and light um, members in one family. Um, yeah. Um, what you often find is that if you really connect strongly to an egregore, um, that you have friends but also you have enemies. And, um, just like uh, you will c continue meeting people from the same egregore in different stages of your life who will help you, who will guide you, you also keep ending up with more or less the same problems which are manifested by yeah, the opposite egre egregore um, which your egregore is supposed to or fighting with. So w with, by becoming part of an egregore you don't just get friends, you also get enemies. And depending on how yeah, your position in the egregore, if you grow in position, your friends will get stronger, you will get more help, but also your enemies will also grow in strength. We'll just move into a different power category. Um, often what you, uh, what you see is that in your youth, you're confronted or in a way the, the problems which you had in previous incarnations are re-manifested. Uh, so often the, the fights you had, uh, the struggles you had, you will have again in your youth with your brothers, your sisters, your parents, um, other family members, your teachers. Um, so it is in a way um, helping you to remember your previous incarnation and your previous struggles to remember your strengths but also to remember your weak points. So this is very much the purpose of, uh, of your youth, to reintegrate, if you will, the, the memory of your previous incarnations, which is carried in your soul, and translate it into your current in, uh, consciousness. Okay. Um. Okay, this is a really short question, so I will just pop into this one. Um, the transition from one energetic level to another, so for example from one caste into another, happens without presence of the person's will. Um, yes and no. Uh, this is a very tricky issue. Um, what you see is basically that the person's um, uh, connections and powers 
um, they are in a way a part of the energy body. So it is, it is not a bureaucratic system uh, per se. So you can't just say like, okay, this person, we, we say he's a master, so therefore he or she is a master. Or we say he's a guru and therefore he or she is a guru. And the same with priesthood. Um, it can't work in that way. So in order to, uh, to have a different position within the cosmos, um, that position has to become uh, part of your energy body. So for a person to become a light, they have to have a sword, not merely in a physical sense, but also in an energetic sense. It has to be part of their energetic structure, this sword. Um, the same with shields and staves and all kinds of other elements. They have to become, uh, yeah, in a way, integrated in their, in their system. And this is a process which can go, uh, which can happen naturally. So you can start out growing a sword or growing a staff or growing a shield or a cloak or whatever um, symbol of power or structure which yields you certain powers uh, you want. Um, but it can also be uh, granted. Um, so often uh, an egregore or a god or a goddess or some power may yeah, want you to do something and uh, to be able to accomplish your, uh, yeah, your goal you need certain qualities and these qualities can be granted to you. It's in a way like an uh, initiation. Uh, during an initiation the energy body becomes transformed. And this is a transformation which can happen naturally, so through self-initiation, through just normal spiritual growth. Or it can be accelerated by um, an egregore or a god or a goddess or in, an agent of the egregore or god or goddess uh, granting the initiation. Um, the initiation is in a way by nature um, semi-voluntary. Um, so you are not the one doing it, it is the power of the egregore or the god or goddess or the priest or priestess acting upon you which uh, changes your energy body. Um, um, but you yourself have, can or cannot grant uh, access to your energy body to, uh, to this egregore or uh, initiator or initiatory power. Um, one of the ways also to, to work, if you're interested in self-initiation, is to visit um, holy places which were used for initiations. Um, so there are some old Neolithic places, there are some um, um, actually uh, Christian places, there are some not very nice places in ancient Egypt um, which you can visit. And by being in, in such an initiatory uh, place, there are many guides there who help specifically with the process of, uh, of initiation or self-initiation. So if you don't want to find a master or a teacher to, uh, to perform the initiation for you, um, going to a place like that is very useful or making a trance journey to get into direct contact or into a higher energetic sphere where the energy is more flexible can also help you with this, uh, with this process of uh, moving from one cast into another. Um, one important thing to remember though is that we are defined by the lowest energy, not the highest energy which we possess. So I can have some uh, royal qualities uh, which make me very noble, um, but if I also still possess a lot of very heavy sins, I'm very greedy and um, very mean and sadistic, and then I am not a king, I'm a criminal. Um, and ultimately how you, are, uh, how you are seen by, not so much by other humans, but really by the rest of the cosmos, is much more your, um, your average amount of energy or your lowest amount of energy, never your highest amount of energy. So this is very human tendency to look at like God look at what I have achieved or what I can do um, where there's a focus on a very small part of your energy body which is yeah admittedly in a very high state but just ignoring everything else um, 
but this is much more uh, a tendency of the ego which can be focused on just one thing and forget about everything else but no energetic being will look upon you in this uh, in this way um, so and it is ultimately a lot easier to elevate your uh, your lower energies a bit and thereby make progress of your whole than to try to push one of your talents into the highest peak possible um, so just for efficiency's sake it is best to to just work with your own heavy side uh, in, uh, and thereby create uh, yeah, a better energetic environment for yourself than uh, only seeking contact with the highest spirits because the highest spirits will probably just kick you back down uh, because they feel you don't belong in their world so this can also happen with an egregore uh, if you are given initiation into a very high ag egregore which, with very pure spirits uh, the spirits will probably just kick you back down again and out of the egregore because you don't belong there because your energy is still too polluted or too heavy um, so it is very much about um, the slow and stable growth is by working on your on your heavier things but you can in a way bootstrap yourself by making contacts with something higher you can get more insight more knowledge of what you can be or what you're supposed to be or what beings on this higher level are like and this can help you with working on yourself as you are so uh, little excursions into higher cosmoses higher states of awareness are very useful but uh, such an excursion is more of an experience than really uh, a, a transformational uh, event. Okay, yeah, this is more or less in the same line. So, uh, could a person get out of a not very light egregore if this egregore already is operating in the person's family line? What will happen to the person and to the family and to the egregore? I think here it's also very important to make a little bit of a distinction about the height of the egregore, um, how high a consciousness it can encompass. Um, because uh, usually when we, sport, when we talk about egregores, we talk about uh, spiritual egregores. Um, but there are also lower egregores, which are more horizontal in nature. So a city can have an egregore, a country can have an egregore, a people can have an egregore, a political party or even a, a big company can have an egregore. Um, and um, these egregores are only uh, traps if the consciousness of the person uh, cannot overcome it. Uh, so if you can only think of yourself as a material being um, then you're trapped, then my god, I'm a Dutchman and I live in the city of Breda and if I identify with that, that's where I'm stuck. But if I uh, can think of myself as um, uh, a human being, then you're not limited to being Dutch or being a citizen of a certain city. Um, and uh, by the higher level of consciousness uh, that also gives you some control over the of the lower energies which are present in the egregore so if I realize that I'm a human being I'm still Dutch and I'm still living in the city but um, I can become aware of how being Dutch or living in the city influences me and I can also try to inspire the energies in the country or in the city to well, not to, to distract me from my past, to work together with me and they become tools instead of only blockages. So every egregore um, is in a way trying to impart certain goals um, but 
the goals are not necessarily um, uh, forced upon you, but they will be constant uh, pulls. So, for instance, if the if like my city has a very strong competition with the neighboring city, if I don't do anything, I will get into this competition. I will fight them, and we will compete against each other. But by being aware of it and recognizing this energy, I can choose not to react to this energy or only to react to this energy if I want to. Um, but it also will require really um, an act of consciousness, a conscious control of these lower influences because you are part of that current which is trying to drag you in a certain direction. But by having a higher consciousness you can in a way swim against the current. But depending on the strength of the current it is harder or easier to do. Um, so, and yeah, the question is here specifically not so much about the national egregore, but the egregore which is in a family line. Uh, it is possible indeed because certain powers are in a way uh, gifts or egregores or connected to a certain egregore. And these powers can in a way uh, instead of just being imparted by the uh, incarnating uh, or taken along with the incarnating spirit, they can also go from bottom up and be nourished in, in a bloodline um, so that indeed an egregore builds up better inc incarnations for its members uh, on the earth. Um, and this is a tricky thing because the power itself is connected to the egregore, so your bloodline itself can be connected to this egregore, which is um, just part of it. Um, ultimately, to get loose of that or to get free of that, it will require um, in my energetic surgery. Uh, that power has to be released because there's at best a dual control over it. The egregore controls it and you control it. And if you don't agree with the egregore, there will be a constant tug of war how the power will manifest itself. And at the moment you're not conscious of the power, then the egregore will try to control that part of your life, that part of your being. So ultimately it is usually best to uh, rid yourself of that part of the energy body. And if you want a similar power, then you can just recreate it from a light egregore or from out of your own soul or your own spirit. But then it is your own energy instead of the energy of the egregore. Um, and in a way the process of uh, removing such a power from the energy body is very similar to removing a curse or uh, a process of initiation. It's just a kind of a reverse initiation. Um, one thing is, which is very tricky is basically also the, uh, the contract you have with the egregore. Um, because for use of power you build up in a way a debt or um, uh, the egregore will have a certain um, dominance, a certain hierarchy um, in which uh, it can force you to do things or demand things from you. Um, and buying yourself free of such a contract is always a very difficult business because often they will ask you for to do things but by doing these things you will actually get more connected to the egregore. So often the act of trying to buy yourself free can land you in a bigger depth or in a deeper connection with that egregore. Um, so in general it is best to ask for a higher power to, um, to mediate between you and the egregore. Um, and in general, I would uh, usually ask a solar spirit to, uh, to be the mediator. Um, so the consequences for the person of um, uh, yeah, getting out of this uh, not very light egregore are usually a loss of power, a loss of knowledge, uh, a weakening of their health, uh, because one part of their being, which is in a way, yeah, almost like grown part of the egregore, is no longer fed or no longer supported. So it is like giving up, tearing out your eye, or something like that. And uh, in the Bible, it says like uh, that you have to be willing to tear out your own eye if it offends God. 
and it's very similar with getting out of a dark agricore. You have to be willing to cut in your own flesh um, to free yourself from these influences. So it is not an easy thing, it's not a nice thing, but often a necessary thing and the wounds will heal. But yeah, it can take a long time and by a long time I usually mean months or years, not lifetimes. Um, the effect on his or her family. Um, this is usually, um, yeah, the reaction is usually animosity. Um, because other people will feel that you're betraying them, you're not one of them, your behavior is irrational, erratic, uncomprehendable, because they are still under the influence of the egregore. It's very much like being part of a cult or a sect or some fundamentalist religion. Um, so leaving an, an egregore can be a very difficult thing because there are bonds of brotherhood, there are expectations, there is this tie which are in a way severing um, in such a way. And it depends very much upon the, the quality of the heart of the people who are involved, whether they can still maintain the connection uh, in a healthy and good way between you or not. And if the heart is well developed, then they can realize that the connection is not, in a way, depending on anything. It is just um, uh, selfless, egoless, uh, uh, free of any desires. Um, and then you can still have a very loving relationship with them. But if there is, uh, some people also tend to use these connections for emotional blackmail or other systems of control and then there will often be a control struggle uh, which will uh, happen as soon as you even think about leaving the agricore or start leaving the agricore. So often leaving the agricore will can mean yeah, leaving certain members of your family behind or severing your ties of brotherhood or in connection with them. Um, and this is very hard because um, your own yeah, family members can turn into your enemies, but also because your bloodline is still connected, they will have a very good access to you. So they can easily influence you, they can easily harm you or hurt you, and there's yeah, almost no way to protect yourself against it. So leaving an egregore is a, is a major achievement if you can do so, freeing yourself of an egregore. Um, so I have uh, the utmost respect for people who are able to do that. It is harder than getting rid of, uh, of uh, any physical addiction. Um, what consequences it will have for the egregore? Um, the egregore will be um, yeah, slightly uh, upset at losing a member. Um, but it can also choose to lose you rather than infect itself. Uh, because if you're a member of an egregore and uh, you're tied in this brotherhood um, connected to all other beings, then your energy will also, in a way, propagate through this egregore. Your consciousness will also propagate in this egregore. And your power will be shared by other things in this egregore. And if you uh, start developing certain powers, certain ideas or a certain type of consciousness, which is harmful to the egregore, um, then it can be that either the egregore is, is transformed by your presence, so the egregore can turn from dark to light or from light to dark, if you uh, remain part of the egregore. Uh, the egregore can fall, can fall apart if there is too much disharmony, so you can create a kind of a civil war within the egregore. Uh, but most usually you're simply kicked out. The egregore itself will try to sever its ties with you. Um, but then the, uh, in a way the payment has to be the other way around. So instead of you leaving them and having to pay a severance pay, the egregore itself will have to pay you to, yeah, um, to get out. And um, often this is in the form of uh, integrating uh, the powers it in a way knows, it manifests, and giving them to you as a part of your own energy body. So that uh, you will 
in a way incorporate all the powers of the egregore, but you will have control over them yourself instead of the egregore controlling them. Um, so this is in a way the ideal solution if you can um, grow so much that the egregore can't keep up with you and then you can grow and in a way uh, surpass the egregore and still take all the knowledge and power which the, you learned in the egregore which is like a school take it with you to other egregores or higher consciousness and this is also very much how the light side works they tend to try to help people to move from one egregore into a higher egregore uh, the dark side is not so happy if this happens but also on the dark side this happens Okay. Um, I would like to stop for a moment to see if there's any questions now. Oops. Uh oh. I lost the call. Ay, ay, ay. Are you still here? Sorry about that. Uh. Okay. So I would like to pause now to see if there's any um, any questions about what we just uh, talked about. Um, so one of the interesting things is also that uh, between egregores but also between cosmoses um, there can be ambassadors. So people who are in a way from a light cosmos who go into the dark cosmos or the other way around or also between light and dark egregores. And, um, um, they can be in a way uh, uh, peaceful uh, and then they are an ambassador, they can also be invaders uh, who come to attack or to destroy, then they are warriors, um, they can also be masters who in a way try to, uh, who can work with both types of energy and in a way can create a synergy between these two very different uh, powers. I don't see any questions popping up. Uh, see if I can find another nice question. Um, okay. Uh, this is a rather small one because it's already getting a little bit late. So could I tell more about yoga and the relation between yoga and nature religions? Um, in a way, um, all yeah, martial arts, all movement exercises um, are coming from nature religions. So all the martial arts and Tai Chi and also yoga, uh, they're inspired by uh, uh, yeah, the, the movements of animals. Um, because what people observed is that certain animals have certain powers, have certain talents. And um, people who have energetic sight, they can see that certain animals have certain uh, qualities which are better developed. So certain nadis which are more strong or certain chakras which are more strong. And uh, uh, yoga, shamanic dance and martial arts are all methods. Uh, to make those nadis, make those chakras more strong. Um, so ultimately the, uh, the basis is, uh, is very natural, it's very much in, within the nature religions. And often the uh, posture and the behavior is very similar uh, to the animal of uh, which 
power you'd like to copy into your own body or to merge into your own body. And also by making similar movements or and a similar, having a similar focus, you can also connect to the spirit or the collective consciousness of that, uh, of that species. Uh, so there is a very strong connection between the two. Um, what you do see is that um, yoga has gone through the, uh, the hermetic transformation. Um, so instead of just uh, moving and feeling what every movement does, um, uh, the intellect uh, came in and started to create a system out of it. And they started to develop a system and to see relations and in a way it became much more uh, mechanical in nature. Um, there is a lot of discussion, um, which I heard also within the school, whether uh, yoga is light or dark, does it belong to the light cosmos, does it belong to the dark cosmos. Um, and uh, for me personally, I can say that um, uh, I think it is just like any natural power, it is neutral in itself. And it can be used for light purposes, it can be used for dark purposes. And the effect of yoga is simply development. It is that you exercise certain parts of the energy body. I'm now talking just about the, um, yeah, the, the, using the, the, uh, the asanas, using the pranayama. So this is very much on the transformation of the, of the energy body. Um, yoga literally is, uh, is work and there are uh, various uh, methods uh, to, uh, to work on yourself, to improve uh, your energy body. Um, one of them is, uh, is Bhakti Yoga. Um, Bhakti Yoga is uh, basically serving the gods. So if you uh, connect to a god or a goddess and allow them to inspire you, allow them to guide you, and to manifest the power to transform the, the world and to teach what that god or goddess has to teach, then um, you will be turned into a better and better uh, a student of that power. And also your energy body, your consciousness, your physical body will, uh, will alter uh, to become that. So in a way you become an angel, a messenger for that power ultimately. And you can even grow into becoming uh, a god or a goddess or a demigod or a demigoddess yourself. Um, so this is one uh, method of, of self-improvement. Um, but generally um, yoga practices are considered uh, to be karma yoga, which is basically um, that you do something and there's just a cause and effect relationship between the two. So you build up a certain habit, you get used by, uh, in a way, by performing yoga exercises, your energy body gets, becomes better, and you get used to having a good and healthy energy body, and therefore in your next incarnation, you will have a good and healthy energy body because this is what is normal for you. Um, and these two methods can in a way also be combined. You can say, okay, I will practice building up my energy body but I will serve a higher purpose. I will serve a god or a goddess or an egregore. And then you can uh, mix the two techniques together. And it is mainly in this act of, um, of combining um, uh, the yoga exercises in a way the physical uh, or energetically physical exercises with uh, meditation, with concentration, uh, with prayer and also with yamas and niyamas which are in a way oaths or vows, what to do and what not to do, that you align yourself with a certain egregore or a certain god or goddess or uh, other ideals. And um, for me this is also the essence of making uh, yoga more light rather than more dark because power itself uh, is something you build up in, in performing yoga. So uh, people who say yoga is uh, part of the dark cosmos they focus on this, they say you're building up 
uh, cities, you're building up power, you're building up control of your own energy body, so you're growing in the dark cosmos. But if at the same time you're uh, in a way giving your power to uh, a god or a goddess or another higher being or an egregore or something outside yourself and have the humility to turn yourself into a servant, uh, then yoga can become a light path whereby yeah, you uh, should be uh, very uh, clear, of course, that in a way your consciousness uh, has to grow at least as fast as your power because if the power grows too quickly then the power becomes a solution for all your problems and uh, you get too much in love with the state of being and which is very enjoyable because having a clear energy body, a clear consciousness, a good ability to meditate is very nice to have. They're very beautiful skills but they can also be become an addiction. Um, what we see in, in nature religions is basically that um, in nature religions it is a little bit anarchistic. So every, um, every person, every power chooses who to follow. And generally they uh, choose a power who's just a little bit more advanced than them. Uh, so it's very similar in a way to how the Luciferical cosmos is uh, is organized also there are people are looking for an example um, in the nature cosmos it is a little bit more restricted in who you can take as an example because there really needs to be a connection a brotherhood uh, being one um, so in a way you're more tied to your to your group um, so your options are a little bit more limited but also the contact is much more deep if you are functioning in a, in a nature religion or in the nature cosmos. And the same is also true if you are in a way wanting to, uh, to practice yoga in a natural way. So if you practice yoga in the, uh, from the, the, the system of the Luciferical cosmos, you find the greatest yoga, yoga master you can and you just try to do what he or she does and to learn from their example. Um, if you do it in a nature way, you in a way need to find a person you have a connection with, you are one with, who, whose heart is one with yours. And only when you find such a person you can really learn from them. Because it's much more learning through um, absorption. You're more like a sponge, uh, absorbing the vibrations and the energies of the person you're connected to rather than practicing and discipline and focusing yourself as you would do in the, um, in the Luciferical Cosmos. And um, if you in a way want to do yoga and reconnect more to nature, uh, doing it in nature is a very good example or doing it together with animals is also a very good example. Um, because all the powers, um, yeah, the, the all the postures they serve to awaken powers and if actually the, the object which in a way has the power is present then your posture will have a much stronger effect so if you do the cat together with the cat or you do the dog together with the dog then uh, uh, that will help and um, it's also with normal postures it is not as important as it is with developing uh, cities or extraordinary or extrasensory powers. Um, because many animals can act um, uh, much more, uh, with much more skill and much more precision on the energy body than we can. So animals in general are a lot better at uh, influencing uh, their own energy body and our energy bodies than we are. So, uh, because they have, a, uh, as I said earlier, a higher vibration, more harmony, so energy tends to flow from the animal to us um, in a very natural way. So also the knowledge and the power the animal has tends to flow to us if we can make ourselves re receptive to it. And how much we are able to change our own energy body to resemble uh, the animal or the tree or the stone, um, that also uh, creates a better quality of connection between us and our teacher which can be the animal or the stone or the tree and also if uh, 
there are certain very old trees, uh, not so many old animals, but also very old stones, and they retain a lot of the knowledge and experience of the things which were done there. So uh, many people find that by practicing something in a place where their master or their teacher or a great holy man uh, did the same thing, it will uh, really increase the quality of their own exercises and give them much more deeper um, experiences. So if you practice yoga in a natural way, the, uh, yeah, the location becomes very important and also the focus becomes very important. And instead of just focusing on, on Shiva, uh, you can also focus on various animals or various power animals or spirit guides or other gods and goddesses to guide you through the yoga practices. In general, I would say uh, also maintain the focus on Shiva, but add other gods or other deities to it. Uh, because Shiva, as the god of uh, destruction, also helps you to attain the purity which is necessary to um, connect yourself and open yourself up in a very safe manner. Okay. Well, there are still a lot of questions left, but um, <laughs> um, I think if there, unless there are some questions about the topics of today, I will uh, leave it as it is. So I should already say my apologies to Michael, because I don't think I answered any of yours, but Okay, I'll try to get them next week and I'll post the questions to you um, on the email. Okay, I see something coming up. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, hello. Yeah, and if there are any specific questions about yoga, I'm not really, I love yoga, but I'm not very good at it. Um, what I do notice for myself is that the, um, that connecting to the, to the crocodile is very helpful. <laughs> um, because the crocodile is very much uh, an animal which uh, is connected to the river, which waxes and wanes. So very much the cycle of renewal, it's a very feminine animal that way. So if you have problems with your own feminine cycle, uh, crocodile exercises and focusing on the crocodile is, uh, is very good to do. Um, and generally if you want to increase sensitivity, uh, birds are very useful. And if it is about uh, uh, rhythm, about uh, stability, the large herbivores are very nice to, to work with to stabilize yourself. Um, the smaller uh, animals, um, they also help you a lot with uh, using your energy in a good way. So uh, cats, rabbits, uh, animals which really need to exert themselves because they're not all powerful. They really help you to develop your skill, to develop your focus. So depending on the type of thing you want to learn in your yoga exercises, different animals may inspire you or guide you in that. Okay, I'll speak to you then. Uh, oh, something more coming up. You're quite welcome. Glad you like it. <laughs> and I'll speak to you then again uh, next week. Okay, bye bye.